That's it. They called this movement Judeo-Bolshevism. Like, they were like, this is the number one villain in German society is Jewish Bolshevism. Okay? Something that we still talk about in this day and age. Like, they were... Uh, the notion that, like, uh, <laughs> like, the U.S. contributions were not the most significant is also silly. See Germany. Hello. We hear a lot about a supposed Hitler-Stalin pact, and much noise is made trying to link, by extension, two wildly differing ideologies and nations together through some forced horseshoe theory nonsense. If you're unaware, the horseshoe theory claims that the far left and the far right, rather than being at opposite and opposing ends of a linear political continuum, are instead incredibly similar. This is the sort of brain dead take you expect from so-called liberals who consider themselves enlightened when doing their both sides are bad shtick. Historically, the so-called liberal center has always immediately sided with the far right when it came down to it, while the far left was the only one to have any real form of successful and organic resistance. But that's not why I'm here today. Let's discuss the molotov ribbentrop Pact. That's the funniest part about this entire conversation is like the double genocide theory is unironically a fascist one. That's number one. And number two, these are the very same liberals that say, like, the KPD's actions caused a reaction from liberals to Nazis. You're literally admitting that you would now, you know, not even a hundred years after World War II, saying that you would be voluntarily the communists got too out of control. That's insane. That's exactly what happened. Anyway. Note. The USSR and the Stalin era specifically was an incredibly nuanced episode of history. There are no great men, history is made by people and material conditions. Actions aren't taken in a vacuum but instead are affected by real deficits and changes as they occur. Very rarely does something in history happen because someone is crazy, whatever that means. Much more commonly, we're simply missing or refusing to investigate the context. You don't have to like the USSR to be fair to the conditions it found itself in, nor do you need to agree with the actions taken just because you can understand why a certain action was taken. Broaden your mind little, don't insult your intelligence, and be better than those that lap up the laziest pop history propaganda. Let's get started. A frequent trope we hear is this. The 1939 Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was a military alliance between- People still say that every historian acknowledges the suppression of the communists and the bolstering of the Fry Corps greatly aided the Nazis' rise. Yeah, historians acknowledge it. Liberals, like average, average liberals are not historians. We're not talking about like, we're not talking about like actual academics. If you look at the broad majority of like Holocaust and genocide scholars, they consider what Israel is doing to also be akin to genocidal actions, genocidal ideation, genocidal intent. That doesn't change the discourse, though. If you listen to the liberals that want to, uh, that want to defend Israel, they're going to be like, nah, 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 nah. They were asking for it, actually. Palestine's been asking for it. So that's not what I'm talking the about. The USSR and Nazi Germany. This framing usually follows attempts of paralleling the USSR and Nazi Germany, and by extension, socialism and fascism, in an ideological attempt at painting a certain strand of liberalism as a part and somehow more legitimate to the concepts of integrity, quote unquote, being on the right side of history, etc., than socialism. Note that this rarely is used against fascism and is intended solely to paint socialism in a bad light. I wonder why. Let's give some general background information. Soviet Russia and the subsequent USSR, having only fairly recently won a short but brutal civil war with Tsarist forces and invasions by many foreign powers, oriented foreign policy towards Germany in the mid-1920s. Two lesser-known treaties, the Treaty of Locarno and the Treaty of Special Relations with Berlin, helped shape that Soviet foreign policy. The Treaty of Locarno, between the main European belligerents of World War I, sought to establish a lasting peace, which Soviet Russia would generally benefit from, since the country was so utterly devastated by the Great War and the Civil War following the October Revolution. However, the USSR viewed the treaty with suspicion, since it appeared that Germany was joining an anti-Soviet bloc. The other treaty, that of special relations with Berlin, was meant to assuage these fears by being a five-year treaty with Weimar Germany, in which they would be neutral in the event that either country was attacked by also, one thing to always consider is that Hitler was a major West Abu, okay? Both with America and also uh, the British monarchy, England in general. He was a big West Abu, okay? A third party. Unfortunately, the optimism for long-term peace wouldn't last long. In the late 1920s, the Nazis began their rise to power, which infamously culminated in the appointment of Hitler as the Chancellor Anglo of Germany Boo. in 1933. The rise of the Nazis caused the USSR to refocus its foreign policy efforts to combat this threat. 
the policy, which came to be known as collective security, attempted to strengthen relationships with France and Britain in an attempt to isolate Germany. Meanwhile, the fear of Western leaders' imaginations and the interests they served led them to irrationally fear the spread of communism and were reluctant to enter into diplomatic relations with the USSR lest they catch the communist virus. Instead, the West decided that appeasing the Nazis would be a better strategy, and we all know how that turned out. As a result of this reluctance on the part of the West, the USSR was forced to fend for its security alone. Back to the video in just a second, let's hear from Keeps. Male pattern baldness is a genetic condition that affects two out of every three guys by the time they're 35. Goddamn. Get professional care for hair loss from the comfort of your home. I don't know, I would use West Boo argument though, because I mean, he was kind of a Muslim boo as well. Um, agree, I think. I mean, he he was an Aryan. Uh, he, he stole a lot from like Eastern culture and slapped it on to like German, uh, like German mythology. That's K E E P S dot com slash I came. Now let's get to the background of the pact. The Treaty of Non-Aggression between Germany and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, more commonly known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, so named for the signatures of each government, the Foreign Minister of Nazi Germany at the time, Joachim von Ribbentrop, and Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov. The agreement was simple, if one ignores the secret provisions. It straightforwardly lays out a 10-15 to 15 year period of mutual neutrality in which neither country would commit aggression against the other, support or provide aid to a third party committing aggression against the other, among stipulations regarding peaceful solutions to disagreements between the respective countries. However, there are four so-called secret provisions, and the famous partitioning of Poland isn't among them. That is part of the mythos. What Eastern stuff did he steal? Bro, what do you think the swastika is? Like, the concept of Aryan, the concept of the Aryan race and the swastika is just like, he literally ripped that shit and made it so goddamn prominent, dude. He fucking ruined it for like billions of people. <laughs> surrounding the agreement and serves the purpose of demonizing the USSR as well as deflecting blame from the allied western powers appeasement of Hitler and the Nazis. The article that is misconstrued as Stalin working with Hitler to split Poland in half territorially for the same expansionist ends actually states something quite different and reveals the true Nazi intentions which we'll discuss in the next section. Suffice to say it takes quite the quirky reading of the article to come to a conclusion as outlandish as Stalin conspiring with Hitler to split Poland. It takes an equal amount of audacity to repeat this nonsense as historical fact, but well, that's a conversation for another time. Alright, let's get into more detail. We'll start by recalling that the USSR actively pursued overt military alliances with Britain and France in a policy known as collective security. One such offer, made just two days before the war began, had the USSR sending 1 million troops, artillery, and airborne forces to help stop Hitler if they agreed to the pact. Such a pact would have drastically altered the course of history. Unfortunately, both Britain and France declined the offer, forcing the USSR to operate unilaterally without Allied support. With the collective security policy not bearing fruit, the USSR decided the next best course of action was some kind of treaty with Germany that would delay the war machine the Soviets knew were coming for them. Soviets understood that the West's appeasement policy that had resulted in the annexation of Austria and Czechoslovakia was a failure and prelude to an expansionist war by Germany, and that Poland was in Germany's crosshairs next. The Soviets sought to buy as much time to prepare and therefore was left with the unenviable position of having to sign a non-aggression treaty with Germany in order to provide for the security of the USSR and her citizens. All this is also forgetting that the USSR was the last country to sign a non-aggression pact after Poland and France and... Important to... Important to fucking mention this aspect, I think. For many. Okay? This is something that absolutely zero liberals acknowledge as a real part of history when they talk about the Hitler-Stalin pact. Belgium, the Baltic countries, amongst others. That's always never mentioned, I wonder why. If you think this explanation sounds conspiratorial or is commie propaganda, then consider that this explanation was common as early as 1943 when in Time Magazine, former US ambassador to the USSR Joseph Davies, all the while, the irony, of course, is that, like, Hitler's rise to power straight up was on the backs of the Red Scare. Like, that's, that's the, that is the thing that people refuse to comprehend for some reason, which is, like, akin to, at that point, it's akin to Holocaust revisionism. Like, liberalism lends itself so much, so perfectly to, like, this deep, uh, revisionist attitude towards like what the Nazis 
uh, what the Nazis demonstrated, what they represented, what they believed. Like, their number one enemies were literally any kind of revolutionary sentiment, any kind of fucking communism, any kind of trade unionism, socialism. That's it. They called this movement Judeo-Bolshevism. Like, they were like, this is the number one villain in German society is Jewish Bolshevism. Okay? Something that we still talk about in this day and age. We just call it cultural Marxism nowadays. If you want to know what that is, when you hear, when you hear a modern Republican talk about cultural Marxism, they are basically trying to find a more appropriate way of saying Judeo-Bolshevism. They might not even hate Jewish people themselves, but they basically are still ripping the same exact fascist ideology, the same exact... Uh, the, the same exact fascist sentiment, okay? Judeo-Bolshevism turned into cultural Marxism. Not only that, but also, the Frankfurt School is still pointed to. Jordan Peterson regularly used to talk about the Frankfurt School and its indecent, uh, immoral, degenerative impact on western culture you know who else thought that a bunch of jewish scholars who were socialist or socialist adjacent were degenerating society and disrupting the moral fabric of uh, western supremacist ideology the nazis that's who it is damn near identical. Reactionary sentiment rarely ever changes, okay? They adapt to the time. They adapt to the new villains. He was interviewed about various topics regarding the USSR. In his response to the fifth question about the USSR's opaque foreign policy, he said, in part, and I quote, when they, the Soviets, lost faith in both the will and the capacity of the Western democracies to join them realistically to stop Hitler, they still tried to maintain their security and their peace by entering into a non-aggression pact with Hitler in 1939. This was not a pact for mutual offensive against Germany's enemies. In that particular, it provided only that neither would attack the other. They gained precious time, which they feverishly employed to protect their security against the inevitable Nazi attack. This isn't the only mention of this explanation in the same issue of time. Calling the USSR, and I quote, realistic, it backs up the claim with the following. She, the USSR, had been the greatest advocate of collective security. But when she saw that the democracies would not support that policy, she turned completely around and gained time to prepare herself by signing a pact with Hitler. The third mention is brought up in a larger context of other treaties and agreements the USSR had entered into prior, including their acceptance into the League of Nations. And I quote, Under the aegis of then Foreign Commissar Litvinov, the USSR tried to establish collective security as a method of thwarting the rising tide of fascism. But the League of Nations collapsed and was followed by appeasement in Munich, the Soviet Nazi non-aggression pact in 1939, and the entrance of the Reds into the war when Hitler invaded them on June 22, 1941. By now, it should be crystal clear that the narrative that resulted from Cold War distortion is in blatant contravention of the facts. The fact the USSR signed with Germany wasn't a military alliance, it was a means of buying time to prepare for the easily anticipated invasion. Related to the military alliance myth is the claim that Stalin conspired with Hitler to partition Poland between Germany and the USSR in one of the secret articles of the pact brought by the Germans, specifically secret article number two. If you read through it, it's fairly clear as to what Germany's true intentions were. The most obvious happens to be in the first line of the article, in the event of a territorial and political rearrangement of the areas belonging to the Polish state. This is a rather long-winded and euphemistic way to describe an invasion. The phrasing really betrays what the Germans want to do and then presents them in the treaty as a pure hypothetical. Also, remember, this is a secret provision of the treaty, which only serves to further make clear that Germany was starting in Poland in what had till then been a series of easy, albeit diplomatically draining, annexations via the appeasement by Western powers. After all, while the Germans made it obvious that they were bent on expansion, they still wanted to have the veneer of plausible deniability. They soon use another euphemism for invasion as well, since the existence of an independent Polish state is implied to be in the hands of the Signese respective governments rather than, you know, the Polish. With respect, you're a smart guy and you know a lot of these discussions are disingenuous by libs and to try to act like Stalin didn't have sympathies with certain odious aspects of Nazi racism or rather mercenary idea about the sanctity of life is beneath you. There are better ways for us to be communists, my friend.
when we are having a conversation about World War II, this this is a ridiculous uh, assertion. This is a ridiculous insertion in a conversation when we are talking about liberal uh, liberals behaving in a disingenuous manner and promoting an aspect of history. Okay, promoting uh, promoting the notion of like the USSR aligning with Nazi Germany. It is literally a historical of the highest order. Okay. This has nothing to do with like Stalin's uh, own personal uh, Stalin's behavior after or how he conducted his own affairs internally within the USSR, which isn't just uh, Stalin anyway. <sighs> like what a ridiculous, uh, what a ridiculous time to place this people themselves. Poland was unfortunately really affected by anti-Semitic conspiracies in the form of Judeo-Bolshevism, the extremely stupid idea that Jewish people were overrepresented in and thereby controlled the Soviet government. This anti-communist sentiment was a powerful guiding force in the Polish foreign policy. Obviously, is quite condescending a gay he be? Yeah, bro. It's like talking about the business plot or talking about like fucking Patton saying that we fought the wrong enemy in World War II or some shit, and and then and then. Bringing that up to be like, America actually didn't do enough during World War II. America actually secretly uh, was, was on the side of the Nazis during World War II, which is, again, would be a historical if I were to act like America's collective actions, like America's most significant actions during uh, World War II did not greatly contribute to the fall of Nazi Germany. It did shunning the possibility of an alliance with the USSR, Poland sought to force strategic military alliances with Britain and France to guard against a Nazi invasion and signed a mutual defense pact only months before the invasion would actually occur. In this context, Stalin had to make a difficult decision about how to best allow the USSR to survive the oncoming assault, which would be called Operation Barbarossa, which began in 1941. Additionally, the notion that Stalin was secretly planning a joint offensive with Hitler in order to partition Poland hasn't really been substantiated. If you look at the order of events, the reaction of the Soviet leadership, and the actions of the Red Army, which we're going to talk about in a this is hella boring. Suck my fucking dick, dude. Okay, take a fucking day off. I've heard a couple other people chirp like this. Shut the fuck up, okay? It's an 18-minute video. I don't give a shit. If you find it to be boring, then tune out, okay? Go watch someone else. Second, you clearly see that this was not the typical actions of a conquering army. Stalin's focus on invasion threat from Germany and the time he was trying to buy to thwart one was only in regard to the USSR, not Poland. Of course, he only cares about his own nation. The USSR leadership was absolutely blindsided by the Nazi invasion of Poland. It occurred only one week after signing the pact and only one day after the Supreme Soviet approved it. These are not the actions of a state anticipating a joint offensive. Just to be clear, the USSR leadership understood Hitler was planning on invading Poland, but not so immediately and so blatantly. Due to them being caught off guard, the Soviet invasion of Poland not only happened days after the Nazi invasion, but was hastily and poorly organized. The Red Army was still devastated from World War I and the Civil War. Much of the Soviet efforts at the time had been focused on improving the lives of people and rebuilding the country. In fact, Polish citizens were often very surprised that the Red Army was so deprived, as far as armies go at the very least. Citizens mentioned that they're malnourished or poorly clothed, that they were foul-smelling because of a tar that they used in their footwear, as well as mentioned how Red Army soldiers were fascinated by objects that Polish peasants found commonplace. Again, not surprising for a nation that had just started its first round of industrialization. As I note, practically all the areas the Soviets would go on to quote-unquote occupy prior to 1941 either were part of the post sars political structure or had their own episode of the Bolshevik Revolution, which happened to be defeated either by white armies, for example Finland in the Civil War, or German World War I policy, specifically Brest-Litovsk. Okay, so if the USSR didn't conspire with the Nazis to partition Poland amongst themselves and why did the USSR invade Poland? There's plenty of sources that already focus and almost exclusively mention the many unjustifiable mistakes committed by the Red Army, as with any army of course. But this overemphasis really only serves as a way for liberals to equate the communists and Nazis, which is an ideological pool with the depth of a puddle. Let's take a look into the nuance. The USSR leadership's original justification given for the invasion of Poland was to regain lands lost in the Treaty of Riga, which concluded the 1919-1921 Polish-Bolshevik War. Ukraine and Belarus, then a part of the USSR, were invaded by Poland in their attempt to re-establish the borders of the Polish Empire of 1772. In the treaty, the Polish border was established by Britain and the US at 200 miles east of the Curzon Line. However, due to the march of time and the migrations of people that occurred during previous eras, the lands acquired by Poland were no longer ethnically Polish, but were mainly Ukrainian and Belarusian. Therefore, Poland was seen as an occupier colonial power even in these regions by minority groups. The motivations to invade Poland expressed by the Red Army, however, were quite different. 
They claim they were compelled to counter the invasion by Germany and liberate the Polish proletariats and oppressed minorities. Now, of course, this may sound kind of two-faced, but they did genuinely believe this stuff, and the work of Kotkin goes as far as to prove as much. The Red Army used slogans of class emancipation with national liberation, which caused confusion amongst the various minorities who had their own interests and scores to settle with Poland. While the Soviets intended to rescue both Russians and Ukrainians from mostly Polish class domination, each group found support for their own particular ethnic claims and or projects, of course. Red Army soldiers entering Poland, tasked with preparing local populations ideologically for the invasions, shouted slogans which explicitly encouraged the population to, and I quote, rectify the wrongs it had suffered during 20 years of Polish rule, and disseminated very base leaflets, actually, that urged Polish soldiers to turn their weapons against the capitalists, the landowners, and the military officials, which similarly encouraged the local population to assault their landlords with, quote, whatever was at hand, scythes, axes, and pitchforks. <laughs> Anyways, as a result of this propaganda effort, much of the initial brutality that occurred in what would become Soviet-occupied Poland, or reconstituted Ukrainian Belarus, the maps get fuzzy after a while, began prior to the beginning of the invasion proper. It should also be noted that most of it was selected, targeting only those of the then perceived as oppressor classes such as landlords. This is important to mention given that so much attention is given to later mistakes and this period gets unfairly lumped in by liberals since they see mega landlords getting a comeuppance and their land expropriated as a bad thing. I don't, clearly. Anyways, the Red Army wasn't only handing leaflets out, they were also given substantial spending money. This was further facilitated by the ruble being declared legal tender in the occupied area on parity with the Polish currency. Exact figures are hard to pin down, but locals were shocked by the sheer amount of goods the Red Army soldiers were buying, and maybe even more surprising, doing so without haggling prices. As the Red Army advanced through Poland, a significant power vacuum pushed swiftly ahead of it. This created an immediate demand for auxiliary measures to maintain some kind of order. This led to the formation of something called the Citizens' Guard, a voluntary assembly of mostly quote-unquote patriotic rightist citizens in various municipalities. Mostly local people, minor officials, that kind of stuff. And their primary function was to aid the dwindling local governments, who had by then mostly disbanded, in order to ensure the safety of the remaining population, just to maintain order, basically. Unsurprisingly, the Citizens' Guard was legitimized by its connection with the prior right-wing regime, which influenced its ethnic and class structure, unsurprisingly. Despite the widespread anti-communist sentiment of Poland, many towns and villages turned out in large numbers to greet and welcome the Red Army. Not all were spontaneous, nor did all have local organizational impetus. Prior to the invasion, the USSR sent people ahead of the Red Army to organize receptions for incoming troops. The local residents, especially those belonging to the Polish and Belarusian ethnic minority groups, seemed to be prepared for the Soviet invasion, and although some were enthusiastic about their arrival, others needed to be persuaded or coerced even into organizing welcoming gestures. A crucial factor contributing to the positive atmosphere surrounding the Soviet troops' entry was their general perception that their presence prevented the arrival of Nazi forces. Forces, or in some places even expelling them by force. These were compelling reasons to greet the Red Army as some sort of liberator, unsurprisingly. You have to remember that. They didn't want to develop Poland though, Soviets feared them. Soviets still fear the Polish. We all fear the Polish. One day, Poland will develop and, you know, everyone else will know. Along with the massive anti-Semitism within Poland, there was also at a time a fairly large radical left movement that was all but crushed and dispersed by the far right-wing government. Anyways, One day. celebrations, whether organic or not, were very amicable, predominantly comprising young individuals from ethnic minorities such as Belarusians, Jews, and some Ukrainians. They included the construction of triumphal arches, the raising of troops of flowers, hugging and kissing them, the usual stuff. Soviet invasion plans emphasized the importance of a proper and cordial reception because they saw it as a precursor for a plebiscite that would bring forth the political will of the local populace. With all the celebration, much of the older generation was still terrified, though. Some even went into hiding from the Red Army or worse. However, since the Red Army's approach, characterized by restraint and selective action rather than indiscriminate violence, they managed to garner a measure of relief among the general population, specifically against the groups that were usually targeted, which include officers, policemen, landowners, etc. What's more is that Red Army soldiers, despite commands to the contrary, usually did engage with locals and establish some sort of cordial relationships. After the Red Army established control over the areas they occupied, they embarked on local governance, forced to maintain order, but also to help channel it towards the provisioning of the Red Army, arresting reactionary societal figures, preparing the elections that were upcoming. For the next 20 months, the region that the Soviets occupied experienced a heavy dose of electoral policy. Politics. There were three different elections, two of which were within the first six months of the occupation. The United States didn't bother to do that with half the places they occupy, and their explicit goal is apparently democracy. Anyways, I have relevant reading recommendations that you can check out here if you're interested in how the USSR worked and all that. Anyone who has a proper understanding of how the Soviet system worked isn't surprised by how the Soviets operated during the occupation as it relates to civil engagement and participation. Now, it should be clear as to why Western sources demonized the USSR and tried to put the Red Army in its conduct on par with the Nazis. The USSR stayed mostly true to their principles during the occupation of Poland. 
It should also be clear just how nonsensical the claim about the Soviets and Nazis conspiring to partition Poland is. Rather, the Soviet occupation of Poland could be seen as the Soviets' attempts to save as much of the Polish population from the violence of the Wehrmacht. Unsurprisingly, there are several reasons, and not all of which were altruistic. Despite that, the Red Army and the Soviets were generally preferred to that of the Wehrmacht and the Nazis, except for a select segment of anti-Semitic Polish people and Ukrainians of Poland who preferred the Nazis because Judeo-Bolsheviks and all that. Regardless, they were greeted warmly by the population, and even though not all were locally organized by enthusiastic support, the conduct of the local populace seems to indicate that most people saw them at a minimum as the lesser of two evils. Doesn't make everything they did right, but historical nuance is a interesting and fun thing to discuss. I look forward to random 14 year olds complaining in the comments because I didn't say Stalin ate Polish babies. And a final addendum, this one will just be a bit rambly. For the love of God, please don't misunderstand me. The Soviets made many, many mistakes in this. It would have been better that there be no pact, it would be better for them to have not occupied Poland, but if you were in the particular place and the particular industrialization level facing the same kind of danger, I don't know if you would have made better decisions particularly, especially when there was goodwill shown in the form of collective security with France and Britain, which would have prevented all this nonsense to begin with, or at least greatly affected it. Oh. Do you think the Soviet Union would have survived if they weren't so kleptocratic? I don't. There's so much more that they did wrong. Um, it's. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how the Soviet Union would survive. All right, we're gonna get back to the 